So what I'd like to do this morning is speak to you on a topic that is quite dear to me. And the title I've given to my sermon is this. He must increase, but I must decrease. Let me repeat that. He must increase, but I must decrease. Why don't you take your Bibles and let's open them to John chapter 3. John chapter 3. And I'd like to read verses 22 to 30. John chapter 3, 22 to 30. After these things, Jesus and his disciples came into the land of Judea, and there he was spending time with them and baptizing. John also was baptizing in Anon near Salim, because there was much water there. And people were coming and were being baptized, for John had not yet been thrown into prison. Therefore, there arose a discussion on the part of John's disciples with a Jew about purification. And they came to John and said to him, Rabbi, he who was with you beyond the Jordan, <clears throat> to whom you have testified, behold, he is baptizing and all are coming to him. John answered and said, a man can receive nothing unless it has been given to him from heaven. You yourselves are my witnesses that I said, I am not the Christ, but I have been sent ahead of him. He who has the bride is the bridegroom, but the friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly because the bridegroom's voice. So this joy of mine has been made full. He must increase, but I must decrease. September 12th, 2021 will forever be inscribed as a pivotal date in Meg's and my lives. Everything changed that day. Because on that day, I lost my ministry. What? <laughs> you lost your ministry? How did that happen? Well, on that day, I literally handed a red baton to the new pastor of the International Church of Geneva, a church I had started 13 years earlier, a church that was thriving. On that day, that Sunday, the place was packed. We sang like you did this morning. We prayed. The church then graciously honored Meg and me for the work we had done. I in turn honored the church and the elders who served so faithfully there for so many years at my side. I honored the new pastor, a friend of many years, who had transitioned with me for a year to get him ready without a glitch. They asked me to preach on that day. I preached my last sermon. It was a great celebration. And the service then was followed by a beautiful buffet. I mean, boy, the food was just unbelievable. And then, ladies and gentlemen, it was over. People began leaving one by one. Fact, it's been like this for 37 years. Meg and I were practically the last people to leave. So when it was time to go, we went to the chairs, gathered our stuff, walked out of the meeting hall in the hotel we'd been meeting in for 13 years. We headed down to the parking lot underneath the hotel, opened the door, got into the car, turned the key, started the motor, swallowed hard, and we drove away. Went home. That was my last day as the pastor of that church. And Meg and I have decided not to attend that church because we don't want to mess up, you know, the new pastor by being there. So, our ministry of 13 years was over. And honestly, during the last 16 months or so since that day, I've at times asked myself the question, John, did you do the right thing? After a couple of minutes of 
thinking about this. I always answer the same way to myself. Yes, yes, it was the right thing to do because of John 3.30, which says, he must increase, but I must decrease. By the way, I want to give credit where credit is due. This message is greatly inspired by a sermon I heard by Ray Pritchard, preached at Shepherd's Conference 360 in Cary, North Carolina. really hit me, so I'm using that and, you know, reworking it so it fits me. But there it is. There it is. He must increase, but I must decrease. What an amazing verse articulated by John the Baptist. Because you see, this verse is pivotal in the life of John the Baptist. In one instant, John the Baptist realized that his massive, exciting, thriving, successful, blessed public ministry was coming to an end. He understood what his role was, and he was ready to give it up once the time was right. So my my purpose this morning then is to help all of us understand how, oh, this hurts, how to anticipate our ends well, or our end well. How to anticipate, yes, the end of our lives, that's true, of course, but also how to anticipate and accept with grace and gratitude the end, or at least changes, major or minor changes, of our ministries one day as well. Hey, listen, like it or not, like it or not, you won't always be in the ministry you're in right now. That goes for everyone who's serving the Lord. One day, someone will replace you, bottom line. The question is, are you ready for that? And John the Baptist, I believe, helps us understand how to get ready for that very important transition in our life. And a transition that may happen at several times, several times during a, life's, during a life. Now, I'm not implying by this sermon topic that Meg and I are done with ministry. We're not done, and you're going to hear about this in a minute. Not by a long shot. And I will, at the end of the sermon, tell you what the next plan is for us. But this message helps us to deal with transitions that can sometimes be painful. Loss of ministry can hurt. In fact, any loss can hurt. So let's jump into the life of John the Baptist and see how he did it, using John chapter 3 as a base text. I suggest a simple six-point outline to help us understand how John the Baptist transitioned. So, number one, number one, the maxim, the maxim, John 3.30. He must increase, but I must increase. Decrease. Interesting little phrase. We're all familiar with it. What does it mean? I mean, what's the point of this phrase? Well, the context in verse 22 in particular, after these things, Jesus and his disciples came to the land of Judea, and there he was spending time with them and baptizing. That verse indicates that the he in this verse refers to Jesus. So, he, Jesus, must increase, but I, John the Baptist, must decrease. I would like to zoom into three words in this verse, in this sentence, that are really important. Number one is must. Must. He must increase, but I must decrease. What intrigues me is this word. Would it have been different if John the Baptist had said, he can increase, but I can decrease? Or if he'd said, he should increase, but I should decrease. No, he didn't say that. He said, he must increase, and I must decrease. And must in in Greek means must, necessary. Jesus in Matthew 16, 21, uses this very word this way. Very familiar with this too, 16, 21 From that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and the chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised up on the third day. He must. He knew that had to happen. 
And so here we have the same thing. Jesus must increase and John the Baptist must decrease. There's no other way. Second word I want to zoom into is the word increase. This is really interesting. I mean, what kind of increase could happen to the Son of God? Think about this for a minute. It's being said about Jesus. How does he increase? I mean, he always was the absolute Son of God and always will be, so how could he increase? How could he become more than he already is? Because if you go anywhere, anywhere, you will find the sovereign, undiminished, and unchanging Son of God. Take your telescope and go past all the galaxies of the universe to whatever is beyond there, and there he stands, the sovereign, almighty Son of God. Take your microscope and go past the smallest, tiniest subatomic bit of matter, atoms, protons, neutrons, electrons, or even quarks, whatever they are, and there he stands, the sovereign, almighty, Son of God. If you come to Geneva, we have this thing called the CERN. It's the European Organization for Nuclear Research. We have what they call this, the largest hadron collider and particle accelerator in the world. Now, if you don't know what that is, welcome to the club, okay? This thing is a circle, 27 kilometers, I'm guessing 23 miles, 22 miles long, a huge 22-mile circle underground that goes half into France and half into Switzerland under Geneva. This massive deal thing, okay? And I don't know how this works, I'm not a scientist, but they've got all around that big massive circle 1,624 magnets that are probably 10 times the size of that piano. We've been down there. There's some scientists in my, in my church. So they open that like once every, you know, three years or two years when the magnets and everything stops, you got to kind of refurbish everything. So you go down there and you see this, this like this tube and then these big magnets and you're under there, you're going, what is this all about? It's like, it's just total science, okay? And what they do is they smash atoms head on. So they, they take an atom and they spin it around this thing one way, and atoms the other way, and all of a sudden, boom! They, they, they hit them together and they explode. I mean, like millions per second, billions per second, they explode. So all these scientists are looking in a microscope, whoa, check out the explosion, how cool is that? And they're trying to figure out what all of that is made of. I mean, thousands of people are employed by this place. Now, everyone knows what they're really trying to figure out. It's how the Big Bang happened. That's what they say. They want to find out how the Big Bang happened. So they bang things up to see if they can reproduce it. But we know that they can keep looking for the smallest particle in the universe, and they still will have to ask themselves a question, how did this happen? Does it really make sense to conclude that nothing exploded and created something? Does that make sense? That is irrational. No, the only explanation, ladies and gentlemen, is that all of this came about by the almighty Son of God. Amen. And Colossians 1.17 says, He is before all things, and in Him all things hold together. So, whatever it means, He must increase. It cannot mean that Jesus is going to increase in innate greatness or deity, he can't become greater than himself. I mean, after all, he is God in human flesh. So how can he increase? What does this mean? Well, the answer seems to be this. His increase is his increase on earth. In fame, if you will. He must increase here on earth by an ever greater knowledge of him around the world. That seems to be the only, only way to interpret this. The problem is that the greatness of the Son of God is not always seen or appreciated or applauded on earth. Have you noticed? But he must increase despite the opposition. 
an opposition there is. I see this opposition to Jesus big time in France. I mean, we've lived there for 37 years. I've got a lot of the history just even in my book. During the Reformation, France killed and expelled over a half a million Protestants in France. Today, the effects are still visible. It's a leading country in secularism. It's just astounding and scary. There are so many doubters and haters and attackers, so many people who want nothing to do with Jesus. They're humanists. Should we be surprised by this? No. John 1.11 says that he came to his own and they did not receive him. In fact, Jesus said he must be crucified. They ended up crucifying him. Even his own family rejected him at the beginning, but he must increase anyway. You see, his innate greatness cannot increase, but the knowledge of the Savior must increase every day, even in the midst of world opposition. Folks, that is why we exist. That, that, that is why we exist as Christians. He, he saved us, of course, to glorify him, but we have a mandate to preach the gospel to every creature, right? Mark 16, make disciples of all nations. Matthew 28. And so we are, by our evangelism, I love what you're doing there on the streets right here in, in, on, on, on Sherman Way. See, we are attempting to increase the knowledge of him all around us, and sometimes at great cost, as we are rejected and hated, just as he predicted we would be in John 15, where he says, you will be hated. So that seems to be what John the Baptist meant when he said, he must increase, but I must decrease. But there's a third word that we would need to look at. The word decrease. Decrease. He must increase, but I must decrease, said John the Baptist. Jesus was to increase in fame, then John the Baptist had to decrease in fame. Or to put it another way, the impact of John the Baptist's ministry decreased as the impact of Jesus' ministry increased. And what is amazing is that John did this voluntarily. It was planned, even though at times it was hard. So we understand the use of this maxim now, and its context is applied to John the Baptist's unique ministry as the forerunner of Jesus. But I believe that this example highlights a truism for us. Decrease will eventually come. So that was the maxim, number one. The maxim. Number two. The man. The man. John 3 22 and 23 says this. I just read 22. And these things, Jesus, uh, after these things, Jesus and his disciples came to the land of Judea and there was spending time with them and baptizing. John also was baptizing Anon near Salim because there was much water there and people were coming and being baptized for John had not yet been thrown into prison. So we find out in verse 23 that John was also baptizing in Anon near Salim. What we see here is that Jesus and John the Baptist are both actually baptizing crowds of people near each other. Verse 22 describes Jesus' activity, and verse 23 describes John the Baptist's activity. So my purpose this morning is not to give us an exhaustive biography of John the Baptist, but here are a few interesting features about his life. They're familiar. Number one is call. His call. I mean, he was sent by God. John 1, 6 says, there came a man sent from God whose name was John. So that's really important to remember. When we look at John's life and we, we see it decrease and we, and we see it get really complicated, never forget, he was sent by God. And God is sovereign. God never makes a mistake. Even in the trials of our lives, God is sovereign. So even when life gets tough, we need to remember that as part of God's plan. We'll see this in just a second. Number two is birth. His birth. Whoa, no ordinary birth. I'll guarantee you that. Luke 1, verse 13. Sorry, I'm using a new Bible. It's kind of complicated. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zacharias, for your petition has been heard, and your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you will give him the name John. You have 
will have joy and gladness, and many rejoice at his birth, for he will be great in the sight of the Lord. He will drink no wine and liquor. He will be filled with the Holy Spirit while yet in his mother's womb. And he will turn many of the sons of Israel back to the Lord their God. And he will be a forerunner, verse 17. Okay, I think that's pretty significant. I mean, I don't know too many people whose births were predicted by like the angel Gabriel. That, that, that's, that's a pretty good deal there, right? Okay, that, that, that's unique, I would say, very unique. And he finds out that he was going to be great in his sight. They find out he's going to be great in the sight of the Lord. He would be, this is kind of a weird one. I wish we had time to develop all this. He would be filled with the Holy Spirit in his mother's womb. That ain't bad. <laughs> that, that, that's pretty amazing, isn't it? Verse 15. He would be a great evangelist because he would turn many of the sons of Israel to the Lord their God. Verse 16. He would be a forerunner to the Messiah. Verse 17. He would make the people ready for the Lord. Verse 17. That's not bad for the beginning of a life. How about his age? Well, we find him in the desert. Luke 3.23 says that he was about 30 years old when he began his ministry, which makes John the Baptist six months older than Jesus. So he's about 30. Think about anyone you know who's about 30. That's the... That's the age of John the Baptist. He's 30. How about his lifestyle? Oh, this is a good one. Pretty interesting. Matthew 3, 4 says, Now John himself had a garment of gamble's hair and a leather belt around his waist, and his food was locusts and wild honey. I don't know how he prepared those locusts. I mean, I'm assuming he probably had to take the wings off like that, maybe put them in a pan, fry them, a little honey, salt, pepper. I don't know how exactly to do it. But you know, today in France, this is like even around the world, eating bugs is becoming part of like high tech. In fact, you guys were chefs, right? Did you guys ever cook with bugs? No, maybe you'll have to someday because I think that's becoming a real popular food source, bugs. I hope I'm not around anymore for that. But anyway, that's just the way it is, okay? But he, he, he ate grasshoppers. Interesting. So in short, this is the man. Th- this, this is the man. Number three. Number three. The ministry. The maxim, the man, his ministry. John 3.23 says what? And John also was baptizing in Nahon near Salim because there was much water there. And they were coming and were being baptized. So the author of the Gospel of John, the Apostle John, sums up the ministry of John the Baptist by explaining that John the Baptist was baptizing. That's why we call him John the Baptist. But it's Matthew that gives us the best short description of John's ministry that I would just kind of summarize here, just out of time. But if you go to Matthew chapter one, chapter 3, excuse me, He says, in those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea, verse 1, saying, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand, for this is the one referred to by Isaiah the prophet when he said, the voice of the one crying in the wilderness, make ready the way of the Lord, make his path straight. So we find in verse 1, and I'm summarizing his ministry, he was a preacher. In verse 2, it says, he says, repent. So he preached repentance, repent of your sins. In Luke 3.3, 3, he preached the forgiveness of sins. So repent of your sins. That means you can be forgiven by God through the Son. We'll see that in just a second. Verse 3, he preached the coming of the Lord. And in John 1.19, oh, what an incredible verse. John 1.19, 129, excuse me, 129. And the next day he saw Jesus coming to him and said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. So he was preaching Christ and preaching that Christ could actually take away your sins because he came to take away the sins of the world by his death and resurrection. And to him, his future death and resurrection, of course. In Matthew also he says that he preached repentance that had to be manifested by fruit. Oh, that's kind of like lordship salvation. Verse 11 through 12, he preached that judgment was coming. He didn't avoid difficult doctrine of judgment and hell. And finally, he baptized Jesus in Matthew 3, 13 through 17 and experienced the Trinity in full force. Wow. The voice of God, 
the dove of the Holy Spirit and Jesus, the Son of God, right in front of him that he baptized. So what was the impact of his ministry? Matthew 3, this is really important. Matthew 3, verse 5. Then, listen, Jerusalem was going out to him, and all Judea and all the district around the Jordan, and they were being baptized by him in the Jordan River, and they confessed their sins. Okay, I just want you to notice what it's saying here, the detail. The detail. Jerusalem was going out to him, all Judea and all the district around the Jordan came to be baptized, confessing their sins. I mean, that is a ton of people. A ton of people. Folks, I'm talking as a pastor now. That is like the dream ministry. Dream. This is what every pastor in his heart, he might not confess it. We like crowds. We like large ministries. It's fun. It's exciting. There's nothing wrong with large ministries. This was a massively large ministry. Awesome. But that's not what I want to focus on. What I want to focus on is the brevity of his ministry. You see, one of the things that amazes me about the life and ministry of John the Baptist is how brief it actually is. See, one day he's there, next day he's gone. That's his story. As Ray Pritchard says, quote, John the Baptist was like a great comet streaking through the night. For a few weeks, a few months, we don't actually know how long this took place, this baptizing and preaching, repentance of sins, how long, for how many days, weeks, or months, people were just crowds coming down to listen to him and get baptized. I mean, just, just, just imagine those crowds. That's just a lot of people, hundreds, maybe thousands. We don't know. And then it's over. It's over. It goes that fast. Here he is. Gone. Gone. Why? Jesus showed up. And once Jesus showed up, everything changed. John 1, 29, I just... Read it to you. The next day, John the Baptist saw Jesus coming to him and said, "Uh uh-oh, competition is here. He he could have said that, right? "Uh Uh-oh. No, 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 no. What does he say? Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. John the Baptist ends up baptizing Jesus, and the voice of the Father is heard from heaven. The Holy Spirit comes down in the form of a dove. Here you see the triune God in one place in the New Testament. Wow, think about this. You're John the Baptist. Thousands of people are coming to hear you. Thousands are repenting. Thousands are being baptized. Jesus shows up, the Son of God. You baptize him. You hear the voice of God. You hear the the Holy Spirit come down or see him come down in the form of a dove. And you you baptize Jesus. And you're going, whoa, this is like the best, man. I mean, this is like the best ministry possible. I mean, seriously. Seriously. I mean, talking about success, that is the ultimate successful ministry. This guy was the best, the most popular, the most famous, the most effective, the most blessed, the most awesome preacher in Judea. Everyone was coming to hear him. Until Jesus arrived. (laughs) Number four. Number four. The misunderstanding. The misunderstanding. John 3, John 3, 22. Sorry, I'm jumping around, but that's the way John the Baptist's life is portrayed in the Bible here. So we just got to kind of go to where the verses are. John 3, 22 to 26. After these things, we've already read this, right? He came to the land of Judea, baptizing. But verse 23, John also was baptizing. So, Jesus is baptizing, verse 22. John is baptizing, verse 23. 
So Jesus and his disciples are in Judea. Jesus is baptizing. Verse 23, John and his disciples are also there. They are baptizing. Verse 24, this happened before John's imprisonment. That's what it says. For John had not yet been thrown into prison. Verse 25, a dispute breaks out between these disciples. Therefore, there arose a discussion on the part of John's disciples with a Jew about purification. So we don't know who this Jew is, but there's a question about baptism. We don't know what the discussion is. There may be doubt about what's going on. Why are you doing this? You know, we don't know. Verse 26, the problem, look at this. And they came to John and said to him, Rabbi. So now the, his disciple, the, the disciples of John the Baptist come to John the Baptist and say, Rabbi, he was with you beyond the Jordan to whom you have testified. Behold, he is baptizing. And listen, all are coming to him. Wow. Did you catch that? John the Baptist's disciples are seeing what Jesus is doing. The crowds are going to Jesus now. So they come back to John and say, John. Everyone is going to Jesus. Uh-oh. Shrinking ministry. That hurts. That really hurts. See, as soon as Jesus appears on the scene, baptizing all those people, verse 26 says, all began to leave John the Baptist to join Jesus. Jesus, that's what 26 says. All the people that are with John the Baptist are now like, bye. We're going to Jesus. <laughs> I want to be John the Baptist before that. There, that hurts. You see, the church next door is attracting all the people. And your people are leaving the church. Ouch. You see, it's at moments like that that you begin to find out the truth about yourself. Oh, it's a grand thing to be the leading pastor in town, in your city, in your denomination, in your mission agency. Or in the country where we serve as a missionary. Missionaries go through this too. You know, the bigger the ministry, the more clout you have. That's the way it goes. When you're the leading pastor of a large church or a missionary in thriving ministry, you get the spotlight. You get the attention. You even get the invitations to go speak at conferences. That sound, that feels really good. You know, it's funny. We're in Paris for 10 years. And when I took the first church, my job was to build it up to a dependence. I took it. There were 53 people in the church. Ten years later, we had grown massively to 83 people, for real. In fact, it had grown so massively that they organized a church growth conference. Guess who was the honored guest speaker? Me, because I obviously knew how to do it. 53 to 83 people. It felt so good, but I thought, what a joke. You know what I'm saying? It's interesting, but it feels good to get the spotlight. It does. And there's nothing wrong with that, actually. But it's, it is easy for fame to get to your head. That's a problem. Success ruins far more people than failure does. So the real question here is, what was John's attitude when his men came to him and said, John, we are losing people to this other guy you baptized, Jesus. Well, that leads to point five, the marvel, the marvel, the marvel of his answer. John 3, 27, what does he say? John answered and said, they said just before that, he is baptizing and all are coming to him. Verse 27, John answered and said, a man can receive nothing unless it has been given to him from heaven. You yourselves are my witnesses. And I said, I am not the Christ, but I have been sent ahead of him. He who has the bride as a bridegroom, but the friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly because of bridegroom's voice. So this joy of mine has been made full. You know what he says here? Verse 27, here's my answer. My ministry was given to me from heaven. I am satisfied with that ministry that God has given me whether it's big or small, couldn't care less. Number two, verse 28, I am not Christ. I am Christ's forerunner. I know my position in this whole deal here. I know what I've been created to do. I'm the forerunner. Verse 29, I am not the bridegroom. I am the friend of the bridegroom and rejoice over the bridegroom arriving at the wedding. He says, my role is to rejoice over the fact that the bridegroom is here now, Christ. So my joy is full, he says. Full. 
You see, John the Baptist perfectly understood the nature of his own ministry. He was there for one purpose, one purpose. You know what it was? To point to Christ. That was it. To point to Jesus. It was not about him. It was about Jesus. And John 1 has an interesting addition to the question of John's identity. At one point, the Jews send a delegation to him to try and figure out who he is. You remember this text. They said to him, you can't just point your finger and excoriate people and baptize them like that. We don't know you. Who are you? You, you? you didn't go to our schools. I mean, who do you think you are, John the Baptist? So they say in John 1, 19, who are you? Verse 20, he says, I am not the Messiah. They say, are you Elijah? He says, no. Verse 21. Are you a prophet? He says, no. Verse 21. Who are you then? Good question. And here's his answer. Are you ready? John 1, 23. Here's my answer. I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness, make way for the way of the Lord, just like Isaiah said. You know what he says? You want to know who I am? Here it is. I'm a voice. Period. I'm a voice. See, he knows who he is. And if you know who you are, you don't have to be, you don't have to pretend to be someone you're not. John was the voice for God. Nothing more, nothing less. John 3, 28, I am the forerunner. I have been sent before him. See, God raised up this man for this ministry at this moment in history, and he was completely content with his role. The fact that he was a voice defines his ministry. That means that from the outset, John the Baptist probably knew his days were numbered because he understood that his purpose in life was clearly to introduce the Messiah to the world. Did he know he was going to end up in a pl- his head was going to end up on a platter? No. Did he know that he didn't have long to live? No. Did he know he was going to be arrested by Herod and that he would be thrown in jail and rot there for weeks or months? No. Did he know he would go through a period of major doubts in prison? No. All he knew is that the arrival of Jesus meant that his public ministry would soon be over. His ministry had an expiration date. He probably knew that. You know, uh, one guy described life. Okay, so let's talk about life. 38 seconds. Are you ready? This is our life in 38 seconds. Your life and my life. We're born. We crawl. We walk. We speak. We make friends. We play games. We go to school. We become teenagers. We go to college. We get a job. We fall in love. We get married. We have kids. They grow up. They move out. We get another job. We move. We get another job. We move again. We make a few more friends. We make a few enemies. We save money. We invest. We travel. We move some more. We make more friends. We lose more friends. We grow old. We retire. We move to Florida. We fish. We golf. One day, we stretch out on the recliner or take a nap, and we just don't wake up. There's our life, 38 seconds. Where are you right now? (laughs) I know where I am, man. I'm feeling it every day, folks. Ooh. 66 years old, things started like really starting going down, man. Whew. You see, it's interesting. Life expectancy always ends at zero. At some point, something happens. COVID, cancer, heart attack, stroke, stray bullet, car accident, plane crash, earthquake, flood, terrorism, even war. You're here, you're gone. Boom, boom. Now, that's true of life. It's true of ministry also. Today, you have a ministry, and another day, it's gone. It goes that fast. One day you're a church planner, next day you have no more church. Oh, I know someone that happened to several times. It's gone. Now, I'm not saying our church planning years are gone. i got a, just one minute to tell you about what that, that's all about. But this is the way we transition. Now, hold on to your seats, because the story of John the Baptist is not over. It's very surprising. Here's the amazing part. You see? When you look at John the Baptist's life, you go, wow. I mean, what a faithful guy, right? You deserve a break. You deserve a vacation in Florida, John the Baptist. Come on. Wow. What an incredibly great ministry you had. I say, not at all what happened. 
Matthew 14, 1 through 12. We don't have to go into de- we don't have time to go into detail. John confronts Herod about his adultery. He was a true guy who knew that to go to heaven you had to repent of your sin. Herod, you're the king, you're in adultery. Boom. Well, Herod didn't like that too much. He ends up in jail. And in Matthew 11, he goes through a time of doubt. Wonders if Jesus is actually the Messiah. We all go through doubts. Jesus sends them two Bible verses, Isaiah 35.5 and Isaiah 61.1, and encourages them. And you think, oh, cool, Jesus, you can just like snap your fingers, open that jail door, and pull them out of jail. Well, that's not all what happens. Jesus did not rescue him or get him out of jail. In fact, things get worse for John the Baptist. He ends up being decapitated. So, you're going, whoa, did he fail? Did John the Baptist fail? I mean, how, how can you end up so tragic like this? Luke 7, 28 answers the question. Jesus says, I say to you, listen to this. Among those born of women, there is no one greater than John. Yet who is least in the kingdom of God or is greater than John? You know what he's saying? He's saying that on earth, no Man has ever been greater than John the Baptist. That's amazing, isn't it? Because he submitted to his call, that of a voice and a forerunner. And when his job was done, it was done. Short life, short ministry, great honor. Count Zinzendorf, who was the founder of the Moravian Missionary Movement, used to say to the young missionaries they sent out as preachers, this was their job description. Here it is. You ready? Go, preach the gospel, die, and be forgotten. Please, we're recruiting. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> and they came by the hundreds. So that leaves last point, the meaning. We all struggle to let go at times, don't we? The meaning. No one likes to hear, we don't need you anymore. So what's the point of all this? Well, there's a point of life or multiple points in our lives where we must let go. We must decrease, and that is okay. It has to be. It was okay for John the Baptist. It has to be okay for us also. This is part of life and ministry. We will have to let go sooner or later. I mean, today I'm preaching. The day will come when I will not be able to preach anymore. It's just reality. Our job, therefore, while we're here, is to promote Christ. That's what we're called to do. And one day, we go and we will be forgotten. So, my advice is hold on lightly to what you value greatly because it doesn't belong to you anyway. This is the lesson of John 3.20. He must increase, but I must decrease. So what happens once you've decreased into oblivion? Well, consider this. John the Baptist had a shocking end to his life. His head is on a platter. But do you remember the rest of the story? After they beheaded him, they buried him, but Herod couldn't get him out of his mind. He knew that John was a good man, Mark 6, 20 tells us. And then you remember what happened? When Jesus became famous, do you remember what Herod thought Jesus was? In Matthew 14, 1 through 2, he thought that Jesus was John the Baptist who had come back from the dead. So that means that even when John the Baptist was dead, God was using him to convict Herod. So even when you die, your ministry is not over, folks. God can use you even when you are dead. So listen, if this morning you are increasing, if your ministry is thriving, and for some of you maybe that's the case, and whatever it is, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Just don't take credit for it. Just use it. Use that platform God has given you. Let the people come. That's great. But if this morning you're decreasing, and some of us are, some of us are, give thanks for what God has done. And remember, the seasons of life come and go. Let God use you in your weakness and in your fear and in your doubt and your uncertainty. You're no less a Christian because life is hard right now. And we come to the bottom line, the message of John 3.20 is the same for all of us, whether we are increasing or decreasing. You know, a few months ago, we were invited back to our church in Geneva, the one I'd left. And uh, I was there kind of talking to people in this 
couple I'd never seen walked in. I thought, oh, cool, new people in the church. And uh, they came, they looked at us, we looked at each other. They didn't recognize me because I wasn't the pastor. And she walked right by me. I'm going, she, she, she didn't stop to say hello. It's like, and I realized, oh, I'm not the pastor anymore. She thought I was the visitor. And for a second, that really hurt. I wanted to scream, don't you know that I started this church 13 years ago for crying out loud? You should say, hello, pastor. No, I was already forgotten just a few months later. Forgotten. That hurts. But it's right. It's right. So you think, oh, John, that means you're done now, right? No, nope. got a brand new project. <laughs> Just got this approval this week. You pray for us. I'm probably crazy, okay? We're going back to Geneva, and we're starting a new church. <laughs> Please pick me up, okay? <laughs> but we're starting an English-speaking international expat church. We have the United Nations there. We have thousands of English speakers and there's a huge need. So GMI, our mission board, Grace Church, they think this is a really interesting idea. And so the Tetros are here because uh, they're probably going to be our colleagues to get this thing going. And so we really need your prayer. There's no one yet. We have nothing except go and may God bless you. <laughs> so if you could just pray that God would just lead us to the right people and see a, a solid English-speaking expat church started in Geneva, Switzerland. That is our greatest desire today. If you come to the Sunday School later, I'm going to show all these slides. You can see pictures of Geneva. I'll tell you more about it. But anyway, I really hope this ministered to you. It helped me again this morning to realize, okay, there's, there's lows and highs in life. Here we go again until we have to decrease again. So Lord, thank you so much for this day, for this wonderful passage, and this incredible man, John the Baptist. Lead us, Lord, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. If you'd like a prayer card, I've got some. And sign up for our... Thank you very much. And you can also sign up for our newsletter if you'd like to.